like knowing you. The depth of satisfaction, the joy, the peace, the strength that comes from you is incomparable because you, Lord, are matchless. Now, Father, I pray, would you enable me to step aside? And Lord, would you step up that people would see and hear you through your word this morning and be drawn to you? We pray these things in your name. Amen. One of my favorite authors who is very colorful, very imaginative, is well-respected author and pastor Max Lucado. Some time ago, I received a gift that was a book called It's Not About Me. Inside the book, he tells the story about a time when he was a young man. He worked as a, as a guide in an art museum. His task was very simple. It was to lead people to the paintings, answer a few questions, then step aside so that they could see the painting. He did really well. In the beginning, he walked his guests up to the framed masterpieces, he identified the artist, and he stepped out of view. He would step up to a painting and say, this is a Monet. He would answer a few questions, and then he would step aside and allow them to look at the painting. And they would ooh and ah, and maybe ask a few more questions. Then he would step up to another painting. He would say, this is a Rembrandt. He would answer a few questions, and he would step aside and allow them to ooh and ah over this Rembrandt painting. All in all, he said it was a delightful job. One that he took a great deal of pride in. In fact, too much pride. So much so that he forgot his role. He began to think that people came to see him and not the paintings. So much so that he began to linger longer with each painting he presented. And as they mood and awed, he would smile and say, Glad you like it. And his face would flush and his chest would lift. He even responded with an occasional thank you, taking credit for work he didn't even do. So with each show, he began to linger longer and longer in front of the artwork so that the visitors had to literally crane their necks around to see the works of art. The very work that he had been called to reveal, he in fact was concealing. Finally, his boss stepped in and said, this job is not about you, Max. Don't obscure my masterpiece. I think what a fitting story that is so true of us as followers of Christ at times in our own lives. Christ has called you, He has called me to be great commission believers. That our task is to point the world to Christ, to answer questions, and then step aside and allow them to see Jesus Christ. But oftentimes we forget our role. We become absorbed, self-absorbed. We get sidetracked from our mission. And we linger when we should be exiting, allowing people to focus on Christ instead of us. Well, if you have your Bibles, open with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. At this point now, in the book of Hebrews, 10 chapters... We are more than three-quarters of the way through this sacred masterpiece of literature, divinely written by the hand of God. And with each chapter, the author has faithfully been guiding us on a tour, if you will, through astonishing Old Testament masterpieces of the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. He's shown us the unparalleled beauty and majesty of the person and the work of Christ, His redemption that He has secured for us on the cross, His conquering sin and the grave, and His ascension to the right hand of the Father. And with each chapter, the author has been very careful to answer our questions about Jesus and then humbly step aside so that we could see Him front and center. It is fascinating to me that nobody knows who the author of Hebrews is. And there has been debate ever since the book was written, essentially. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Well, the author tells us at the very front that the Holy Spirit wrote the book of Hebrews. But who's the human author of the book of Hebrews? Well, judging from the way he talks about Jesus, 
The Apostle Paul is a fair candidate in my book. Because when you look at Paul's life, everything about his life was pointing people to Christ, answering their questions about him, and then stepping aside so they can see Jesus. You hear it in everything he writes. You hear it in his heart. He says, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for the finishing, finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Do you hear that? His life was all about making Jesus front and center, full attention on Him, not Paul. He said, I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the real world to preach the good news. It was all about Jesus for Paul. But Paul more than simply pointed people to Christ. He showed them how to live for Him as well. And that is, in effect, what is happening in, in chapter 10 as we come to these eight verses that we're going to look at today. Verses 19 through 25 really kind of form a hinge point in this amazing book of Hebrews. The first three verses are really summary verses, if you will, encapsulating everything that he's talked about in the previous ten chapters. And then he moves forward in verses 23 through 25, and he's going to say, now, here's how you should live as a result of everything that we've been talking about in the previous ten chapters. So let me just read these verses for us, and you can hear the change, the shift, as you read through these eight verses. Listen carefully. Verse 19, he says, therefore, and whenever you see a therefore in Scripture, you wonder what the therefore is therefore. The therefore is saying because therefore. Therefore, there was something he had said already before and he's reflecting everything on that. Therefore, he says, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, now he shifts gears. He just made two summary statements of everything he just said. Now he's going to give us three let us. Let us, let us, let us. Here's the result of how you should live based on who Jesus is. He says, first of all, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our, of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaken the assembling together as is the habit of some. These are the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Now, if you're a Jew and you're reading this, you're going, wait a minute. Because this is radical. This is earth shattering. You don't talk like this. Nobody went into the holy of holy place. Nobody came before God. And now he's saying, therefore, brethren, by the, but this is the confidence we have to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. This is earth shattering. What he's saying is that God, through Christ, has thrown open the door of heaven and he's opened it to sinners, Jew and Gentile alike, and he's opened it with arms wide open of welcome, saying, Come, by the blood of Jesus, come into my presence. By the blood of Jesus, come into my throne room. By the blood of Jesus, come to me. This is radical. And we as Gentiles miss this, or worse yet, we as Gentiles have heard this language so much we don't hear it anymore. You have confidence and secure access to the very throne room of God by the blood of Christ and the blood of Christ alone. That is not something you go, oh, that's nice. That is exciting. That is amazing. You have direct and personal access to the very presence of God Himself. Amen. All right. <laughs> if I pass out up here, I want to hear real loud. Anyway. <laughs> now, I want you to notice something that he says here. Again, this is a very Jewish book. He's writing to Jews, and they pick up on it right away. But for us Gentiles, we're a little slower, a little more deaf. But you notice what he says here. Daft, is that the word I'm looking for? How about deaf and daft? But notice what he says here. He says that 
By the blood of Jesus, we have a new and living way, which he has inaugurated, listen carefully, through the veil that is his flesh. Through the veil that is his flesh. He's saying that that veil that separated the holy of holies and the holy place in the tabernacle, that place that separated holy God from sinful man, that thick veil, that ornate veil that was made up of blue and scarlet and purple colors with two huge cherubim, that is angels carefully embroidered on there, fierce angels, to remind you of the warning of the holiness of God that was on the other side of the curtain, that veil, that veil was the flesh of Jesus. That is profound. He is saying that that veil anticipated the Messiah. And there's something about that veil that tells us about who Jesus is. Well, it's made up of blue, it's made up of scarlet, and it's made up of purple. Blue is the color of heaven. And it reminds us that's where the Son of God came from. He came from heaven above. He left His throne of glory and clothed Himself in humble humanity. And that is His origin. He came from heaven. It's also woven with scarlet. Interesting, the Bible says that Jesus is the last Adam. The word Adam in Hebrew can mean either man or red. This is a reminder that He is the final, the ultimate, and complete sacrifice. That the Son of God who came from heaven became the last Adam who is the final, the complete, the ultimate sacrifice. He is blood, sacred. Well, what does purple mean then? Something very interesting about the color purple, it is the combination of two equal parts. The combination of the color red and the combination of the color blue. The color purple anticipated that Jesus would be the perfect God-man. In other words, theologians call it the hypostatic union. I want you to memorize that word because you'll be tested on it when we leave here today. The hypostatic union. It's a fancy way of saying this that Scripture clearly teaches, that Jesus was both completely God and completely man. He is the promised Messiah, the God-man. His humanity and His deity are so woven together, so profoundly fused together, if you will, you cannot separate one from the other like the color purple. You cannot see blue, you cannot see scarlet, but you see purple, therefore you see Jesus, the God-man. And the author is saying this, listen, he said, Jesus is that veil. The Gospel of Matthew, Matthew tells us the very moment Jesus breathed up his, gave up his spirit, breathed his last on the cross, he says the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. It was torn from top to bottom. Now this veil was a replica of the veil that was in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. It wasn't the actual veil, but this veil was enormous. It was 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and 4 inches thick. Why? Because it was separating the holiness of God from the sinfulness of man. Some time ago I mistakenly said, well, I think the veil is about 12 inches thick. I don't know where I read that or I saw that, but in fact it's 8 inches less than that. It's 4 inches thick. But still, 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and 4 inches thick. And Matthew is very careful to say that when Jesus breathed up his last, the, the veil was torn, literally torn from top to bottom. Signifying what tore that veil? The very hand of God tore the veil, separating sinner from God through Christ. Not only that, he says it was torn. It wasn't taken down, set aside, and folded up. It was made invalid. It was made useless. And that's what the author has been saying all the way through the book of Hebrews. Chapter 8, verse 13. He says, when the new covenant comes along, the old covenant is obsolete. It's invalid. It's torn. It is no longer any good. So he says, Jesus is now the new and living way to God that had been promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He is the new covenant promise. And by the blood of Christ, we have access 
to our Heavenly Father. By the blood of Christ, we have access to the very present room of God Himself. So what he's saying, the first fact that I want you to live out and be confident about is this. He says, I want you to know that by the blood of Jesus, you have confident and secure and permanent access to your Heavenly Father. No other way. Now, I can't spell this out clear enough, but Scripture sure does. Too often we make it the blood of Jesus and, don't we? Yeah, you've got to believe in Jesus and get baptized. Yeah, you've got to believe in Jesus and go to church. Yeah, you've got to believe in Jesus and, 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 and. There is no and. It's only the blood of Christ alone, period. That's it. We want to complicate and confuse things, and God says, no, no, no. It's by the blood of Christ alone. He alone is only the worthy sacrifice who can atone for your sins, nothing else. There's nothing you can add to it, or it wouldn't be the gospel of grace. So the first great fact that we're called to live in is that we now have direct and confident and bold access to God, to the very blood of Jesus, and Jesus' blood alone. Second fact that we're called to live in is that we have a great high priest, Jesus. Verse 21 says, We have a great priest over the throne or the house of God. This is the only place he calls him the great priest. Signifying that this is the ultimate, this is the final. There is no other priest. There's no one greater than Jesus. He is our eternal great high priest. Now what he's saying here is this, that Jesus' torn body and shed blood it is permanent and access. What that practically means for you and for me is that no matter what you're going through in life or what circumstance you're facing, whether finances or health or relationship issues, or you find yourself in a place that it's so dark, so hopeless, so miserable, you go... It, is anything ever going to change? Is light ever going to break through? And it's in those moments of need that he says, I want you to remember this. When you're in the darkness, don't forget what you learned in the light. And I want you to remember you have eternal, unchanging, unending access to God, your Heavenly Father, even in the dark times. There's always hope. You can always turn to your Heavenly Father. Probably one of the greatest experiences of gratification for me as a father is when I see my daughters going through a troubled time, a dark time, a struggle. And they come to their dad. There's no greater honor. No greater privilege. But it's saying we believe, Dad, we want to hear what you have to say, we want to share these things with you. And God says, I am your heavenly Father. And when your heart breaks, my heart breaks. And when you struggle, I struggle. And I'm here for you. I want to listen, I want to help, and you have permanent Bold, unchanging access. The door is open anytime, any day. Probably one of my favorite heroes of the early church is an impressive man by the name of John Chrysostom. Chrysostom was not his real name. That was his nickname. He was named Chrysostom because it means literally golden mouth. He was so articulate, so eloquent when he spoke. It literally captivated thousands of people as they heard him speak. But it wasn't just that he was an eloquent or captivating speaker. It's not that he was like the Shakespeare of his day. No, no, no. Far more than that. Here was a man who was impassioned about Jesus Christ. And God took that eloquence. He took that articulating ability. And he woke with the passion of Christ. And he attracted literally thousands of people to come hear Christ. In other words, John Chrysostom understood what it means to point people to Christ and then step aside and let them see Jesus. He was impressive in just about every stature that you can think of in his life, whether intellectually, spiritually. He 
And you can see how he's pointing the emperor to Christ. The emperor said, I'm going to banish you. And he said, you cannot banish me, for this world is my father's house. God is sovereign over this. You're not sovereign. But I will slay you, said the emperor. No, you cannot, said this noble champion of faith. For my life is hid with Christ in God. I will take away your treasures. No, but you cannot, for my treasure is in heaven, and my heart is there. But I will drive you away from man, and you shall have no friend left. Oh, no, you cannot. For I have a friend in heaven of whom you cannot separate me. I defy you. There is nothing you can do to hurt me. You see, when we have access to our Heavenly Father by the great High Priest and the blood of Christ, nothing, nothing, nothing can get in the way of that. The Apostle Paul said, if God is for us, who, who can be against us? If we have Christ, He is our secure anchor to our souls that no matter what we're facing in life, we have a strong and secure and welcoming arms of God saying, come to me. Come to me no matter what it is. I welcome you through the blood of Christ, the high priest. You see, with great privilege always comes great responsibility, isn't it? So he shifts gears now in the next number of verses. And now instead of dwelling upon what he shared with us, he's saying now as a result of these things, here is then how you should live. And he gives us three great commands that we are called to live out. The first one is simply this. It's found in verse 22. Listen carefully what he says. It's the first of three let us. Let us draw near with a sincere heart full of assurance of faith, having hearts sprinkled clean and an evil, uh, from an evil, evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What he's saying is this, commit to a life, listen carefully, commit to a life of growing deeper in Christ. Don't be satisfied with where you're at spiritually right now. If you're dull, if you're bored, if you're calloused, and your walk with God is not because God has, doesn't have any more to offer you. It's not because you've come to the end of all that you can see of God. It's because you've come to the end of yourself. Ask God. Say, God, would you renew my vision of who you are? Show me in greater capacities, greater heights of who you are. And then don't just pray that. Act on that prayer. Begin to make Christ the focus of your life. Grow deeper in Him. And that's really what he's saying in this passage. He's saying, be determined, listen, be determined to align your beliefs with your behavior, your behavior with your beliefs. Line your life up with who Christ is and the priority of who he is in your life. If he really is God's son, if he really is the God-man, if he really is your Savior, if he really is your Lord, then don't just say it. Be it. Do it. Act on it. Let us draw near and make him the single most focused passion of your life. He illustrates this in a couple of ways. Now we have to remember, this is a very Jewish book. And if you're Jewish, you go, oh. But if you're Gentile, you go, huh? <laughs> so what he's saying here is that we are sprinkled, our hearts have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed in pure water. He's illustrating the point of what it means that we're to draw near with a sincere heart. Why? Well, because your heart has been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. To a Gentile, we'll go, what? To a Jew, they go, wow. What he's saying is this, is that Christ's blood literally sprinkled your heart, cleansing it from the guilt and the evil conscience that you had. In the Old Testament, the Jews understood well that both the priests and the people were sprinkled with blood at the inauguration of the Old Covenant. Moses sprinkled blood on them. This was a symbol of dedication to God. So what he's saying here is that you are fully dedicated to God by what Christ has done for you, but he didn't do it on the outside. 
Because it didn't affect their outside, it didn't affect their inside, it only put blood on the outside, but it didn't change their heart. But now through Christ, He has literally changed your heart. Not just the outside, but the inside. He says also, your body's been washed in pure water. What does that mean? Well, some think, think that is probably pointing to baptism, water baptism. But it's not so much important whether this is water baptism or not, but rather it's what it means. The dedication to a changed lifestyle that baptism signifies. Do you hear what he's saying here? Listen carefully again. Let us draw near with a sincere heart full of assurance of faith. Let your life be in accord with what you believe. Let what you believe be in accord with your life. Walk the talk. Live it out. And do it with a sincere heart full of assurance. That's what he's saying. If I could summarize the Christian life, it is a word that we don't hear enough or hear often in the right circles. Too often we confuse the gospel. We say living the Christian life is showing up for Bible study, going to church, etc., etc., etc. It's not about those things. One word encapsulates what Christianity is about more than any other. Surrender. 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 Jesus said it this way, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, if you refuse to follow God's will for your life, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, surrender. If you give up your life, you will find it. The Apostle Paul understood this. He said, I die daily. Every day of my life, I get up and I die to self. I surrender to complete trust in God. Reflecting back on his life that was not only noteworthy of an amazing, amazing accomplishments, Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, he said, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ as my Lord. For His sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all, listen, as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. Jesus was everything for Paul. Everything. Is He your everything? Is He your everything? As I was preparing this message, I, I wrestled in my heart, my mind, trying to find the words. How can I help you understand? How can I give you? How can I nurture inside of you this deep, settled, abiding sense of security and peace and joy that comes from knowing Christ. How can I somehow take it from here and give it to you so you understand it and you want to embrace it? And I realize I can't do that. I can't explain it. But if you've experienced it, I don't need to explain it. You understand you understand surrender. I die daily. It's the toughest thing you'll do as a believer. And yet there is no other way to find the greatest satisfaction in Christ. I don't know who he is, but his name is Nelson Mink, and he wrote a prayer that caught my attention this last week. It's a prayer of absolute surrender. And I want you to hear the simplicity of his words that really capture surrender. He says, Lord, I am willing to receive what you give, to lack what you withhold, to relinquish what you take, to suffer what you inflict. To be what you require. And Lord, if others are to be your messengers to me, I am willing to hear and to heed what they have to say. 
You see, the two greatest words that you can ever say to God are, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because growing deeper means greater surrender. There's no other way. One of the spiritual giants who has certainly shaped my life and countless millions besides me, and I say millions, is a man by the name of A.W. Tozier. He was self-taught. Didn't have a formal education, but he read every book that he could get his hands on. In his day, and continues to be a spiritual giant that has shaped and influenced countless numbers of followers of Christ. He understood surrender. And he also understood the pain of surrender. Listen to his moving prayer. Father, I want you to know. I want to know you, but my coward heart fears to give up its toys. I cannot part with them without inward bleeding. And I do not try to hide from you the terror of their parting. I come trembling, but I come. Please work out from my heart all those things which I have cherished so long and which have become so a very part of my living being, my living self, so that you may enter and dwell without rival. Then shall you make a place for your feet, your glorious feet. And then shall my heart have no heed of the sun to shine in it. For you will be the light of it. And there will be no night there. In Jesus' name, amen. Tozer understood that if we hold anything between us and Christ, it is idolatry. But if we put all things on the other side and put Christ in the middle, it is victory. So the first great command is to, is to commit to living a life of growing deeper in Christ. Can I ask you this question this morning? Is that where you're at? Are you satisfied with where you're at spiritually? I hope you're never satisfied. I'm never satisfied. Always thirsty. Always hungry for more. I'm content but discontent. Comfortable but uncomfortable. Satisfied but unsatisfied. I want more of Christ. How about you? Don't be content where you're at now. Keep growing and commit to growing deeper still. Second, commit to a life of telling others about Christ. He says in verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope with out wavering, let us hold fast this determination without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. But let us hold fast the confession. This word confession is the word homologeo. It means more of not just simply what I say, but also what I do. Not just what I do, but what I say. It is in tandem, both my words and my actions equally. What he's saying is that there are many believers, and we are guilty of it. If somebody were to ask you, are you a follower of Christ? You'd say, yes, I'm a follower of Christ. And they would ask you, well, how many people know that in your life? Well, uh, uh, um, yeah. right? How many people know that you're a follower of Christ? Not just in lip service, but in life service. They see it walked out in your life. That's what he's saying here. He's not simply saying, yeah, I want you to say you're a believer in Jesus. I want you to act like it. This whole idea of, of confession has the idea of an expression of allegiance as an action. Listen carefully to what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to spend your life pointing others to Christ. Not just with your words, but with your life. I want you to be like a road sign. I want you to be like a highway sign. That your task is to point to something greater than yourself. And your lifelong task is to point to Christ. In your words and in your actions. That's what he's saying. I found A.W. Tozier again to be helpful for us. 
He summarized the essence of our allegiance this way. He said, I'd like to ask what right any man has to call himself a follower of Christ if he is not a soul winner. Can I ask you an even sharper question? When's the last time you prayed for and then looked for intentionally to share the gospel with somebody? When's the last time you said, Lord, who do I need to pray for that you want me to share about you with? Ah, oh, okay. Then, Lord, would you open the door of opportunity for me to share with Michael? For me to share with whoever? When's the last time you prayed and then sought the opportunity? Some time ago, I received a book in the mail, and I'm not sure to this day who sent it to me. But it's a good book, written by Tony Evans, who's a well-known speaker and author. The title immediately caught my interest. It's America, Turning a Nation to God, written about two years ago. The 11th chapter captivated me. He said, when you see a culture that is deteriorating, Look closer and you'll probably see the people of God who have withdrawn from the culture and turned it over to the unrighteous to rule. Consider, he said, these developments in America. When Christians begin to abandon inner city and urban neighborhoods, taking their skills or resources and moral influence with them, those neighborhoods deteriorated. When Christians left public, the public school system, moral values were systematically erased until they became almost illegal to teach. I would say no. They have become illegal to teach. When Christians vacated the media, then a spiritual approach to defining everything we hold dear went with them. When Christians decided that they ought to get out of politics, then the majority of the righteous political discussion left with them. Evans goes on to say what Christians have been called to do is influence their society. And the key to influencing any society, look back through history, and it's unmistakable, undeniable. The key to influencing, to winning our nation back, if you will, is called discipleship. Discipleship. Equipping believers to grow from their spiritual infancy into maturity so that they're able to reproduce the process with someone else. We are committed to doing that here. We have men and women and children who are daily almost involved in some kind of activity, some kind of Christ-centered, Bible-oriented activity where they're learning, they're discipling, they're being taught what does it mean to be a follower of Christ. We are committed to that. I am committed to exhorting, to encouraging, to doing whatever I need to do to help you say, I want to be a follower of Christ. I don't want to miss out. I want to change history, not just our nation, for Christ. Evans goes on to say this, the absence of righteousness in our culture has everything to do with the absence of God's people living as his disciples, and thus influencing our culture. It's not that God is lacking people altogether. He has a lot of fans. Every Sunday around our country, our churches are packed with fans of Jesus who are content to remain in the status, or in the stands, rather than, than advance the kingdom down on the field of play. Jesus does not need more fans. He needs more followers. Committed kingdom disciples making an impact on our culture for Him. Can I ask you a question? Are you a fan of Jesus or a follower of Him? Are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower of Him? Are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower of Him? Which one are you? There is no offense right in here. Who 
Who said both? We are not perfect followers, but we've been called to be followers, not fans. And my prayer for you, as we walk through God's Word, as we spend time together fellowshipping, as we spend time worshiping together, as we sharpen each other through Christ and the Holy Spirit, that you become followers of Christ, committed followers of Christ. Our mantra in our church is encouraging people to become fully devoted followers of Christ. It's not encouraging people to become halfway committed followers of Christ, or most of the way committed followers of Christ, but fully devoted followers of Christ. And I need you to keep me on my toes, which you do. And you need me to keep you on your toes, which I hope I do. And we need the Holy Spirit to keep all of us on our toes and the right focus and the right mission of what we're called to do. Fully committed followers of Christ. So the second great command is this, is to commit to a life of telling others about Christ. Folks, I don't know how to say this, we live in a time that the gospel has literally been snuffed out from our culture. Now, if you ask people what the gospel is, people say, yeah, I know about Jesus, I know about the Bible, but here's what I want you to get. Please hear what I'm saying. They haven't heard the gospel. What they've heard is a distorted, a confused mess called religion. But they have not heard the gospel of grace. Don't be content because you say, do you know Jesus Christ? Oh, yes, I know Jesus. I said that prayer. Who cares if you said a prayer? Are you living it out? You see, it's not the prayer that saved you, it's Christ that saves you. Just because you said a prayer when you were five years old, big deal. I know I'm stepping on your toes. But I want to get to the point. If you're, if you're basing your eternity, you're basing your salvation, you're basing your, your, your permanent relationship with God on that prayer, folks, you're not going to get to heaven doing that. You get to heaven and God's going to say, why should I let you in heaven? You say, because I said a prayer when I was five years old. That's a big deal. It's not your prayer that saves you. It's Jesus Christ. Hasn't the author made that clear by the blood of Christ alone? It's your faith in Him, folks, not the prayer you said. How do you know you're going to heaven? Because I'm believing in Jesus right now. And by God's grace, I'm following His will for my life. Be committed to sharing about Christ with others. Third, commit to a life of encouraging others toward greater obedience in Christ. Commit to a life of encouraging others to, toward greater obedience in Him. The final two verses, verse 24 and 25, say, Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as, some, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all of the more as you see the day drawing near. He gives us three commands in these two verses, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time walking through them, but I want to just touch very briefly on them because they're all very significant. The first one is simply this, is let us consider how to stimulate one another toward love and good deeds. The idea is this, he's saying, I want you to personally commit to your life of looking around at other believers and saying, how, how can I encourage so-and-so toward greater obedience, toward a greater desire, toward a greater love in Christ. You ever sat down and thought about that? Lord, who, who do you want me to, to step into somebody's life today and just be a, a, a word of encouragement toward Christ? Let us consider, think about, dwell on how to stimulate. This word stimulate is a powerful word. It means the idea of, of provoking it's almost like a spiritual cattle rod. That's kind of the picture. Have you ever been here with a cattle rod? Do you know what a cattle rod is? Some of you know what a cattle rod is. I've experienced a cattle rod before. Okay, so those of you who don't know, you're not Jewish nor are you cowboy. Okay, I got it. So a cattle rod is this, I don't know, this stick about this long, and it has an electrical charge in one end. And when you touch something with that charge, let me tell you what, 
You light up like a Christmas tree, and you move awfully fast. I know, because I've been on the receiving end of it. And it's, it's kind of a cattle prod kind of word right here. It's the idea of stiffening somebody's life and saying, you know, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to grow in Christ. But then he goes on to say, not forsaking our own assembling together. Well, there are a thousand reasons we can find not going to church, aren't there? God never gives us a command because it's not for our health, not for our well-being. He's saying, listen, it's so important that you come together as a family of Christ on a regular basis. You need that. You need that. Some of you make church maybe once a month, maybe every other month, or when you feel like it. I'm not here to rebuke or to, to, to make you feel bad. That's not my purpose. My real purpose is to say, you're missing out. You're missing. My life radically changed. I didn't like going to church when I first became a believer. Did you know that? I need to be honest with you. I didn't like coming to church. Now, I didn't come here. If I had come here, I'd have been happy right away. But... <laughs> I didn't like coming to church because I was uncomfortable to be around people. Most guys are uncomfortable with crowds. Let's face it. But who cares? Is your allegiance to Christ greater than the allegiance to what you want? Then go to church. Be a part of church, the church family. Yesterday we were helping somebody move and, and someone made me comment while we were moving. They said, you know, this is so cool. This is the family of Christ. I said, yes. Yes. This is what it's about. It's coming together as the body of Christ, the family of Christ. You know, you're my family. Burley said earlier, she said, I'm thankful for my family. And I don't know how many times I've heard people say they're so thankful for their church family. People have actually moved back here because they want to be part of our church family. It's not just us. It's the body of Christ. There's something powerful about the body of Christ. Encourage people to be a part of the church. But he says this, encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Can I just share with you, you have no idea of the power, literally, that you have to leverage in somebody's life with just a few well-placed words of encouragement. You have no idea how you can radically transform somebody's life by a few well-placed words of encouragement. I came across the true story of the power of encouragement this last week. A name perhaps you're familiar with, William Wilberforce. He is the driving and lead personality that was the most influential in ending slavery in England. But it didn't happen overnight. It was a long, drawn-out, discouraging battle to turn the tides of slavery. One night during the evening of the 1790s, he was discouraged. He faced yet another defeat after 10 years of slugging his way through the battle against slave trade. He was tired. He was frustrated. He was depressed. And he was wondering, is this really all worth it? As he grabbed his Bible to find some words of encouragement, out from his Bible slipped a piece of paper that fell to the ground and fluttered there. He picked it up. And he realized this was a note that John Wesley had written to him shortly before he died. His eyes focused on the letters and he read them yet once again. Wesley said, unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that abominable practice of slavery, which is a scandal of religion, of England, and of the entire human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be torn out by the opposition of men and devils. But... If God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. 
Go. Go in the name of God and in the power of His might. You have no idea of the leveraging power of the words of encouragement in somebody's life. Wilberforce pressed on. He eventually saw the end of slavery in England. But I can't help but wonder if I read a note like this, what if Wesley had never written that note? We have no idea, do we? When's the last time you sat down and said, you know, God, who can I write a note to, of encouragement to? I love to write letters. Um, some of you know that. And sometimes I have more time than others to write letters. And I've learned to write in English, actually, uh, over a period of time. Some people said that I write in tongues. And I said, no, no, uh, that's, my own, that's my own form of handwriting. And some of you are very good at interpreting. You must have the gift of interpretation. But I remember some time ago, somebody had received a letter that I had written, and they said with kind of an astonished sound in their voice, they said, I have not received a handwritten letter in years. <coughs> huh. Wow. When was the last time you took a card, just took a letter, and just handwrote a note of encouragement to somebody? When was the last time you did that? You see, here's what it all points to. How are you doing at pointing people to Christ, answering some questions, and then stepping aside and letting them see Jesus? Yeah, that's what he's been doing all the way through this chapter. The author has given us three practical ways of how we can show people Jesus and step aside. Commit to a life of growing deeper in Christ. Commit to a life of telling others about Christ. And commit to a life of encouraging others toward greater obedience in Christ. That's what he's doing. He said, I don't want you to lose track of what's most important in life, Jesus Christ. And I don't want you to lose track of what your mission is in life. Point others to him. And I don't want you to become, become so engulfed in that that you become self-absorbed and distracted so that you linger longer in front of him when you should step aside and let them see Jesus. Do you know that's one of my prayers when I step into this pulpit up here? I say, Lord, as I step up here, this is not a work of man that you've called me to do. This is a work that only you can do through me. So Lord, here I am. And I'm going to step aside. And you step to the pulpit. That's my prayer. That you hear Jesus talking to you. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word that doesn't mince any words. You say it straight, but you say it with love. Lord, I pray for us this morning as we hear your word. We come to you, Lord, in our frail humanity and honestly say to you, Lord, we cannot live this Christian life in our own strength, by our own sheer will. But we need the power of Christ in us, the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we surrender now we surrender self. We surrender ego. We surrender pride. We surrender selfishness. We surrender our very lives to you. Use us now, I pray. Show us how to step out of the way. So that they, the world, can see and hear you.